in wall tech. An affordable way to get the home theater surround sound that you want while being aesthetically clean, hidden, and unobtrusive. But are they the real deal? Let's get into it. Well, fancy meeting you here. My name is Elon Osborne, and this is my YouTube channel where I talk about movies, audio, and music. So if you like those things as well, if you found this video to be useful, or you're just here to watch me make a fool of myself, Please consider these ways to help support this channel so I can continue to make this content on the reg. Like this video, yeah. subscribe, yeah. become a patron, oh. rock some merch, get some tunes, read my children's book to your kids. Link in description. Link, link in description. Boy! And also, if you think in-wall tech speakers are going to be your next home theater purchase, don't forget to use my code ESENTME to get 15% off any in-wall tech brand specific speakers. This sale will be good through October 31st, 2021, so get yours while you still can. Now, the current setup in my living room is a 5.1.4 speaker configuration. So for this video, I was able to get my hands on the flagship HD series of in-wall tech speakers. More specifically, I got the HD 650.2W in-wall speakers for my bed layer and four HD 650.1A speakers to go in my ceiling. What's in the box? Ouch. A paper. <laughs> a box within a box. HD 650.1A. You have to do a little cutout, or at least a little template, so you know how big the hole needs to be in the ceiling. We got a description here, mounting considerations, mounting instruction. Yeah, removable grill. Nice. Nice. As you can see, it's got a 20% angle. Yeah, this build quality is nice. Plus and minus three decibels there. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to having angled ceiling speakers. It'll be nice, especially the ones towards the TV because they're pretty far away from my couch. So if they're angled at me, I'll probably hear what's supposed to come out of the height channels a lot better. Box two of two. A pair of HD 650.2Ws. It's just your normal 6.5 inch trimless two-way in-wall speaker. Two, four, five. So let's check out the one by itself. Literature, again, description, mounting considerations and mounting instructions. Another cutout to know exactly how big the cutout will be in the wall. Uh -huh. Removable grill, no trim, disappears in the wall. I like the feel of that. It's very sturdy. Plus and minus 3 dB with the woofer, plus and minus 3 dB with the tweeter. This tweeter is movable. But this looks very quality and it's very heavy. It's nice. The HD 650.2W in-wall speakers have a six and a half inch Provlar woofer, which is a new and improved version of Kevlar with a butyle rubber surround. It has a one inch pure Zelenium dome tweeter, which pivots up to 30 degrees. It has a sensitivity rating of 89 decibels with one watt at one meter. It has a maximum thermal power rating of 125 watts and a frequency response of 40 hertz to 30 kilohertz. The HD 650.1A ceiling speakers are almost identical with their specs, but just tightly packed into a circular formation, of course. The only difference between the two is that the frequency response goes up to 24.5 kilohertz instead of 30 kilohertz, but that's still above human hearing anyway, so. Uh huh. Yeah. But like I pointed out in the unboxing, it is a nice touch that these particular in-ceiling speakers are set at a 20 degree angle 
for more precise directional audio coming to you from the ceiling. Now, there are plenty of in-wall installation videos on YouTube, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I will put a few links in the description for you. But in a nutshell, since I already had my little Klipsch satellites mounted to the walls, I already had speaker wire coming down my walls to where I wanted these in-wall speakers. So installation was fairly simple for me just because I had already done all the work to fish the wire down the walls when I had to put in those Klipsch satellites. The speakers come with this handy little cutout template for both the in-wall and in-ceiling speakers. So you just need to put it where you would like it, Check where your studs are just to make sure you're going to be in between them and make sure not to be too close to the studs since the tabs on the speakers will then need to latch on to the drywall just outside of the hole itself. Make sure the template is level and mark its position. Then use a drywall knife to ever so carefully cut that hole. I've only been in this particular house for about four years now, but when it was built in 2008, they decided to insulate pretty much every single interior wall in this house. And I read online that putting some insulation behind an in-wall speaker or keeping the existing insulation there is actually a good thing because you don't want the sound to reverberate and bounce around the cavity in the wall if you don't have any insulation. But come to find out that's not entirely true. Uh oh. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay. Then just take a screwdriver and screw in all six of the dog ear tabs so it hugs nice and snug against the drywall. And it is recommended to hand tighten these screws and not to use power tools. You don't want to accidentally tighten it too much and break the dog ear tabs or end up tightening it so much so that the dog ear tabs just bust right through the drywall itself. My ceiling situation was a bit different though. Oh man, what happened? Well, like I said, I moved into this house four years ago and already there were four in-ceiling speakers in place. There were these cheap architecture style ceiling speakers that were just set within this white trim housing. So I removed one just to see what I was dealing with and much to my dismay, the hole was too big. No. I know. It's easy to fix a hole that's too small because you just make the hole a little bit bigger. But when it's too big, that's a whole new set of problems. So my wife and I discussed it back and forth a little bit and she decided that she was cool with me just cutting brand new holes. Because you see, the existing holes were just cut with 5.1 in mind. So they were just supposed to act as my front left and right and my surround left and right. So I did a little math, made a little diagram, made some measurements using a laser level that I had, cut the front height holes to be a little bit closer to the listening position as well as closer to each other, then cut the back holes to be a little bit further back and closer to each other as well. After installing the speakers, I went up into the attic and disconnected the existing speaker wire and then plugged them into the new speakers. I do apologize that I didn't record much of me installing those in-ceiling speakers, but here's a quick recap. You're entering a world of pain. Oh, the pain. <laughs> yeah, it sucked, big time. So now you might be thinking, well, now you have eight speakers in the ceiling, but only four of them work? Yeah, that's why my wife was okay with it, because when somebody walks into somebody else's house, looking at the ceiling usually isn't the first thing you end up doing. In the future, we're probably just going to patch those holes up or maybe put some more recessed lighting in there or something. But for now, we're just going to leave them there because we don't want four gaping holes in the ceiling. But since I now have the new speakers in the ceiling, it allowed me to test them for this review. Ha <laughs> ha! How do they sound? Just to be totally transparent upfront, there is one thing you need to anticipate if you are deciding to do in-wall or in-ceiling speakers. There is a lot of work that needs to go into it initially. Lots of planning to position them in the best spot that works for your room, possibly fishing speaker wire down walls or up walls. And once they're installed because they're in a fixed position, you can't exactly move them around when you have to make some little tweaks or adjustments to your system. So having room calibration software is crucial. 
whether that's Odyssey or some other software that's already built into your receiver, or using something like REW with a calibration microphone like the UMIC-1 from Mini DSP. Ideally, your left and right front speakers are going to be towed in just slightly towards your main listening position. So if you already have a dedicated home theater room, you might want to consider building angled walls into the corners. So that way your front left and front right speakers are essentially towed in. But here are the main reasons why I wanted in-wall speakers in the first place. With my four and six year old daughters, it's great knowing that they won't have to worry about knocking over speakers or speaker stands. With my open concept living room, there really isn't much place to put tower speakers or speaker stands without them just getting in the way. Just being in the middle of a walkway or just being an eyesore for that matter. Before, I did have Klipsch satellite speakers mounted to the wall, but even then, I do like the aesthetics of having a speaker flush against the wall instead of something sticking out on wall mounts. Side note. But let's be honest, my living room is not the greatest to have a home theater system anyway. It's so wide and it's so open. We have a couple of rugs, but it's mostly laminate flooring, so it is very prone to reflections. There's this gigantic set of windows to one side, which you can't really add any acoustic treatment to unless you want gigantic, thick, cumbersome curtains there. So I just wanted to make the most of the space that I had while keeping the minimal aesthetic that I like. Once the speakers were installed, I decided to pop in a few movies and just test them out right out of the box. And honestly, it didn't sound that great. So. I had some work cut out ahead of me. First thing I did was remove some, but not all of the insulation behind the speakers just to give it a little bit more room for the magnetic driver to oscillate back and forth instead of being wedged a little bit too tightly like it was before from the insulation. Then with my Onkyo receiver, I ran the AccuEQ room calibration software, which is like Odyssey, but not as good. Then I also ran REW using my UMIC-1 calibration microphone. Even though these speakers' frequency response does go all the way down to 40 hertz, I noticed that at least in my living room, there's a pretty significant drop in response below 100 hertz. Onkyo's AccuEQ was all over the place with the crossover frequencies, ranging from 40 hertz in the center channel to 150 hertz in the in-ceiling speakers. Just way off. I did get in touch with Brian from Inwall Tech and he did recommend that my crossover frequency should be set to 100 or 120 hertz in the receiver. So I tested both 120 and 100 hertz and it seemed like 100 hertz seemed to do the trick because it sounded much better very quickly. Then I took the data that I got from running the REW tests and then went into the Onkyo's parametric EQ and changed some of the EQ settings for my five bed layer speakers. Although the Onkyo's parametric EQ isn't all that great, since I can only choose to adjust from a selection of fixed frequencies, instead of having the flexibility of being able to dial into a specific frequency that I want to change. So even then it wasn't perfect, but it was still more of an improvement than when I just changed the crossover frequencies. But here's the thing. Oh no, here it comes. I'm still not 100% impressed with the HD650.2W sound overall, even after those little tweaks and adjustments. But starting with the good, the first thing that I noticed when I was watching John Wick 2 in the tunnel shootout scene, these in-wall speakers produce high frequencies very well. Very precise, very crisp, clean, and detailed. I honestly didn't have to EQ anything above 1200 hertz because those frequencies are very present. But once I moved below the high frequencies, I noticed there was just a lack of any mid-range presence. Gunshots, ricochets, bullets whizzing by, body blows, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Those types of sounds just weren't hitting my ears like I was used to. Everything 100 hertz and below was being taken care of by the subwoofer. So I was getting good lows and crystal clear highs, but with that mid-range presence lacking, it just sounded a little bit more hollow than I was used to. It wasn't terrible, it sounded pretty darn good. Just a bit off. Inwall Tech does offer one speaker that is just a step above the ones that I got, the HD525.1 LCR 
which has two five and a quarter inch woofers, a three inch mid-range woofer, and two one inch tweeters. So I'm actually curious to hear that speaker as well because maybe that three inch mid-range driver makes all the difference in the world. On paper, I know the technology and the components in the HD650.2W are solid. I know these are designed with walls in mind, being the infinite baffle design. Where the speaker physically being anchored to a wall assists in the woofer's ability to push out bass frequencies. But with my audio engineering and musical background, I also trust my ears. And the reproduction of mid-range frequencies was just... okay. Even when I was running the room calibration software on my receiver, I noticed a difference when it was playing the pink noise tests out of each individual speaker. For example, it'll play some test tones out of the speakers that mainly consist of just the higher frequencies. As best to describe it, it's something like where it's just higher frequencies, right? And then it'll play a series of tones that consist of high and mid-range tones. So while the first wave sounded like the second wave sounded more like You hear the difference? And coming out of the in-wall speakers, the mid wasn't that midi. That's not a real word. Interestingly enough, when the same test tones were played through the in-ceiling speakers, the mid-range was there. And they're basically identical to the in-wall speakers. Yet there was just more mid-range presence and more body when those tones came out of the ceiling speakers. Just to make sure I wasn't going crazy, I took my old Sony receiver that was lying around and set up a 5.1 system in my master bedroom with the SBS Prime satellite system. I ended up A-B testing the underground chase scene in The Dark Knight, first listening to it in my bedroom and then listening to it in the living room. And yeah, in my bedroom, the mid-range was a little more present, a little warmer sounding than it was in my living room. Another great way to test out just sounds in general and to know if they sound correct or not is to play a video game that you are very familiar with. Just because sound design is so essential in video games and you hear those recurring sounds over and over and over again, it's pretty easy for your ears to spot any slight differences. So when I played Zelda Breath of the Wild, there were some attack sounds or weapon sounds or energy sounds or particular indicator sounds that happen all the time in that video game that just sounded a little bit different. Huh. With all that being said though, please take that with a grain of salt because you might personally think that in-wall tech speakers sound perfectly fine. That's just the nature of home theater. It's totally subjective depending on your sense of hearing, if you have a musical background or an audio engineering background or not, the size and layout of your room, if you have carpet or laminate flooring, so many factors. So who are these speakers for? I honestly think these are for small and mid-sized living rooms and maybe even slightly larger living rooms if they are kind of separated from the rest of the house and not really open concept. These are for designated home theater rooms, which are a little bit more confined and can be more easily adjustable with room calibration software and acoustic treatment. These are for those who like a more bright sounding speaker with high frequencies being more forward, dialogue being a little bit brighter and more detailed and crisp. These are for those who like their speakers to be virtually invisible and minimalistic. And last, but certainly not least, these are for husbands or wives or partners who just don't want big bulky speakers taking up space in their nice living room. On a final note, one thing you do get with InWall Tech is stellar customer service, since Brian is always willing to answer any questions you have because of the nature of InWall speakers and the planning it takes, the preparation, etc. He always got back to me in a very timely manner and was very helpful with my various inquiries. Kind of like SBS, you do get a very personal customer service experience with InWall Tech. So if you're in the market for an affordable way to have an invisible home theater and or whole house audio system for that matter, InWall Tech may be your best bet. While being un while being aesthetically aesthetic key. The current setup in my living room is a 5.1.4 speaker configure 
But for now, we're just going to leave him there because we don't want four gaping. Or you're just here to watch me. Or you're just here to watch me. Or you're just here to make me watch. Tool time. So there you have it, folks. So are in-wall speakers on your home theater wish list? Let me know in the comments below. Once again, don't forget to use my discount code ESENTME for 15% off any in-wall tech-specific brand speakers. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on another video like this one. And of course, always be listening.